doing this show since um, the pandemic kind of started. He lives in London. He's um, you know from the U.S. Uh, we have a kind of a ragtag group of of uh, friends and kind of that have developed in this community that watch this show. And uh, like about um, a week ago, uh, Chris was diagnosed with the Delta variant and through a breakthrough case with AstraZeneca in London. And then kind of like we, no one heard from him for a couple of days on the internet and everyone got really worried. And we managed to activate like a phone tree and find his family who like then called wow. the police and he ended up being taken by ambulance to um, Royal London um, where he was in the ICU and then um, and then the COVID unit as he was telling us for a couple of days and was released today. So he was just telling us his story and like kind of what's been happening. And so um, now everyone's all caught up with what's going on, but it's an honor to have you on the show and thanks so much for making the time. Yeah, thanks. It's a it's a very surreal world, and you know, you know, today especially with the CDC finally backpedaling after I've been screaming for it for two months to put masks back on. It's it, it's it's bittersweet, but I think right now Delta is surging so badly, um, even in very highly vaccinated countries like Israel and UK and much of Europe, which. But most of Europe has already started to exceed the U.S. in vaccinations among the fully vaccinated. So it's, you know, this is a global journey that everyone's on. So um, just want everyone to stay safe. And so one of the things that I think is really coming to mind, particularly in the discussion about COVID-19 and the Delta variant particularly, is that these changes to recommendations, both in terms of COVID research and the medical guide, guidances and the public health decisions, are receiving quite a bit of backlash from just the American population as a whole. Shouldn't we be more accepting as the, of these changes as part of following the science, or how can we better encourage people to become more comfortable with these changes? Right. And, and I think that's a very good question. I think there's two camps. Well, obviously, there's the anti-mask camp, who they were always um, grumpy at public health measures. There's nothing we can do in, uh, about them. But there's those in which we've been precautionary uh, principal camp. Those who've been saying airborne transmission is real, reinfection is real, um, uh, you know, all these different things where you still need to wear a mask, vaccines are good, but they're not perfect. They're still leaky. You still have to control the transmission, not just focus on the hospitalization. And then there's, of course, those who you know, kind of downplay and and those who say, oh, the, you know, the, the pandemic is over. There's, there was a phase, you know, the last month who previously said the pandemic is over in, in May and early June. And clearly that's not true. And obviously there's the public health comms pr crisis of saying that it doesn't transmit, you can take off your mask. And then of course, backpedaling. And then there's the distrust it breeds. And of course, there's, are valid arguments on all sides. But I think in this pandemic, given that, you know, this is not our first rodeo anymore. We're in month 18, 19 of this pandemic. We should have learned that the precautionary principle should have won out. That clearly the, the pandemic was not at the end, even though, you know, cases were low. Um, and we know that reinfection happens. Uh, and we know that the vaccines tend to wane now. And the Delta variant is much more evasive than any other variant. And the elderly are still vulnerable. So I think all these things, had we played the precautionary card and understood that, you know, if you tell people, it's kind of like once you squeeze it, the, the toothpaste out of the test out of the tube, you can't get it back in the tube. Mm -hmm. The problem right now is once in May they said, oh, you don't need to wear a mask. And, you know, and, uh, if you're vaccinated, anti-maskers then heard, oh, you don't need to wear any mask, vaccinated or not. That was what they heard. And now trying to get them to come back and corral in, into the pen to wear masks is just so hard. It's just comms crisis. And, but it's something that we definitely need to do because the Delta variant is the most contagious uh, variant. It is a 2.0 pandemic uh, variant. It is twice as contagious as before. An R naught of six to eight makes it more contagious than smallpox. It's much more severe. It's much more severe among unvaccinated. It's about um, two and a half times more severe than the alpha variant. Mm -hmm. um, that's would, the winter variant. Would and you mind explaining to our four audience? Four times what? more severe than the original. 
what an R naught is, just for to make sure that yeah, the R naught is a reproductive number. That it's just the exponential coefficient. That if mm -hmm. the R naught is three or four, let's just say four, um, one person infects four people. Each of those four infects four others. Sure. You can see how exponentially that just explodes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so. Three and a half to four was the original Wuhan 1.0 viruses are not. This one is six to eight. Okay. And six to eight means one person infects six to eight. Next of that person infects six to eight. I don't even have enough fingers anymore. So this is why it's much more dangerous than before. And and again, um, there's actually a, a debate. If you have a virus that's m not more severe but more contagious versus a virus that's not more contagious, but more severe and kills and hospitalizes more. What will ultimately hospitalize and kill more people? The true, the answer is the less severe, more contagious viruses. And the problem with Delta is it's the worst of both worlds. It is more contagious by leaps and bounds than any other uh, variant mm -hmm. and is more severe, four to five X greater risk of hospitalization and death. And that's from UK, but that's from England and Scotland, as well as Singapore. We know that, that's the fact. And so we, it's kind of bet, worse of worth world, and it's one dose vaccine, very evasive. One dose used to give you like 80, 70, 80% 80 protection. One dose is now around less than 30. There's one study that shows 18%. Uh, with two doses, that, that number shifts, by the way. Uh, last month we were saying like, oh, England found 88% against symptomatic, 79%. But then Israel said suddenly it dropped to 64, 70%. And just last week on Thursday, Friday, they said it's 40% against Delta, two, two doses. And so this is why it's the CDC had to act because we always knew it was leaky the, in terms of transmission. And half of all transmission is asymptomatic half of all transmission and we know that those asymptomatic you know silent carriers even though they may be protected against hospitalization say 90 percent or so by the way protection against hospitalization used to be 98 then last month it went down to 93 and just last week the uh, israel reported 88 percent against hospitalization and so we know that a the protection is not foolproof and it's leaky enough that you even if you're vaccinated, you're transmitting it to other family members and those who are not vaccinated. And of course, the exponential math with an R naught of six to eight will just explode if you don't have any mitigations. So I want to talk for one quick second about how it went from a four to a six to eight R naught, and I, and like and the fact that we're in the four, as you said, this is pandemic 2.0, but there were two variants that happened in between Alpha and De Delta right. and why those were milder and what we can expect and whether or not there is some type of correlate, like some type of um, ratio or some type of predictability about the the extreme, like why the Delta is so much worse than um, the, the, mm -hmm. the previous two iterations um, and what we can expect out of new variants. Like it doesn't seem like this is going away. Like basically what this seems like is the Delta is here now and that there will eventually maybe be boosters or break like kind of boosters or kind of some way of trying to contain the Delta in a better way than we're containing it. Um, but is that even going to be enough? Are we just going to be mm -hmm. chasing this? Are we just going to be chasing COVID for like for, for the, like the foreseeable future? Well, hopefully, hopefully not forever and hopefully not for the next few years. I think the dynamics are like this. Uh, you know, the R naught is just how quickly it spreads with their, without any mitigation. The, the, hence, it's hard to measure the R naught normally. We're inferring it because the R naught means n with net with completely, you know, laissez faire, completely, you know, uh, agnostic of the virus. But we have mitigations. We still have degree of masking. We have vaccinations. So the issue is to bring it down. It, it's a, it's a matter of public health suppression, vaccine suppression, uh, and of course individual suppression with masks and distancing. And of course, also ventilation, air disinfection. Delta, it, 
it's more contagious than the previous one because it they measured it instead of six days until you start testing positive, you test positive in three and a half days. And when you test positive, you have 1,000 times higher viral load. It's just a combination of a just natural mutation that it just is a much better fit to the lock and key of fitting onto your cells. It just, it, it's a, it turns the key much more efficiently and therefore replicates much more efficiently. And hence you have 1,000 times the viral load concentration in your body. And therefore for everything you expel, it's more concentrated. Um, so this is why it's, it's worse in every way, both contagiousness and virulence in terms of severity. The, so going back to mitigations, if you mask, it reduces it. If you use double mask, if you use premium mask, KN95, N95s, it's even better because we know cloth masks and cheap surgical masks are extremely leaky. And so you have to kind of like think, okay, we have to upgrade our masks. It's an, a ventilation issue um, in the summer it gets really hot. In the spring, people go outside because the temperature is great. In the summer, it gets really hot. It becomes an indoor crisis again because you go to indoor air conditioning and you're rebreathing a lot more air in the air conditioning system. Same in the winter time. So this is why oftentimes in the spring, you have this lull. It's an airborne virus. So if you have a lot of indoor activities, restaurants are open again, concerts, big parties, movie theaters are open again. Many people are not wearing masks. These things just compounds. Right. And then so and then, of course, the vaccine, the vaccine works, works against really well against hospitalization, but not against all transmission and infection because the Delta variant is more penetrant. And then the yesterday, the issue was um, last week, the issue was that uh, there seems to be waning. Those who are vaccinated in January had less protection than those who are in February than less than March, less than April. And it's not just due to age. So I think the key to get out of this is you can't, you can't just rely on one. Think of a Swiss cheese. There's holes in Swiss cheese, right? But if you layer enough layers of Swiss cheese together, the Swiss cheese forms a wall, basically. You're not going to get a, a single path through this, all the Swiss cheese holes. And we just have to think of that vaccine as one wall. It's a fence. Everything is a fence. But with enough walls and fences and picket fences and all these you create this, you know, you create this castle, um, castle, for, you know, fortress kind of thing. But the issue is, you know, I'm, I'm an epidemiologist, but I'm also a behavioral health economist. I know the reality is that without incentives, people are not going to comply. There's A, of course, there's carrots. We've had lotteries. We've had buy a drink, free beers. We've had free Uber rides. But those carrots only go so far now I, in certain ways i think we need sticks as in you know yesterday there was a s slate of states on, and cities mandating vaccinations healthcare uh, associations recommending vaccine mandates for healthcare workers or negative covid tests um and of course there's the other issue of entry passes vaccine entry passes like france has it most famously but many european countries actually have entry passes if you want to go to a restaurant or bar you have to show either negative COVID tests in the, within the next, some places 48 hours, some places, you know, 12, uh, you know, uh, 24 hours, and of course, vaccinations. We don't have that, but we should. Although the other thing is in the US, we have cars are easily forged. That's another issue in the yeah. legal world. How do we even deal with that? And of course, finally, there's the, you know, should we change insurance premiums? Because now it's not last year people died unfortunately and got sick but now we have a clearly have something that can prevent hospitalizations and major illness costs and should we adjust that because we we do that for smoking mm -hmm. you know not every state has it but like uh, more than two-thirds of state have adjustments for your health insurance a, premium if you smoke or not but there's a much more one-to-one -one between catching COVID and then being hospitalized and like then like a lifetime of smoking 
and like like and me and like you know there are people who smoke their whole lives and never require like massive cancer care or like whatever else they're few right. but like but you get my my idea there's it's like there are so many other com- comorbidities and other issues with smoking and it seems like it is much more direct and fewer com- comorbidities besides like being older um or in some way immunocompromised right with, right. with so what i'm saying is like it would actually be a much cleaner policy and like cleaner being like less like less kind of more and more direct yes less nebulous than like right than there's doing many something. risk factors for hospitalizations and obviously you know i'm very much for protecting pre-existing conditions and pre-existing risk factors but i think here you know it, there's a clear and present danger delta variant and the, the correlation between unvaccinated and getting hospitalized is extremely high. And you know how we always say the arc of the moral universe is long, but it does bend. The arc of the COVID universe is short, and it bends really fast if you don't get vaccinated. And so I, I think, I think you know, this is a policy that we should implement, um, uh, oh, hopefully. But of course, you need you have to kind of build. This is where a movement building, right? That people have to accept the entry pass system. There will be people who complain. You know, this is again, uh, you know, you do not have a right to go out and drink and drive uh, and drink unlimited and go drive. Like, oh, you're infringing on my freedom to drink a beer and drive home. No, (laughs) because it's a public endangerment, Mm -hmm. right? Public endangerment, you're not allowed to public endanger. And this is also why we don't have smoking in airplanes anymore because your right to smoke ends in my nose. And it's, and it's and just like in restaurants, you breathe out cigarettes, secondhand smoke. We breathe out COVID or coronavirus aerosols, and that it's an airborne virus, just like an ex- secondhand smoke is airborne. But the moment it endangers someone else, when they have to inhale it, that's when you know smoking was banned. And no one really complains about smoking bans in the U.S. actually. And so I think th- we have to take those analogies and try to really use these sticks and to prevent public endangerment. I, I would like to hear, because you brought up also the behavioral part of this and part of the entire um, landscape of COVID and particularly Delta that I find so fascinating is that there's this hostility towards preventative measures that you won't find directed towards these treatments that are once you've caught COVID and you have these therapies that are still experimental, we don't find that the treatment has the same hostility as the cure. So I would love to hear your feedback on that. I've seen that. Um, It's it's very ironic because some of these treatments are much more experimental. Like vaccines, we have, you know, trials, dozens and dozens of trials around the world with a couple hundred thousand people in these trials. But some of these monoclonal antibodies, these treatment trials are done in a couple hundred people in one hospital. Um, Same with, uh, you know, convalescent plasma, it's not that effective. Um, Monoclonal antibodies, drugs, again, not that effective, also expensive, remdesivir, you know. Mm -hmm. And also, again, we also had hydroxychloroquine. But, but, you know, some of these drugs are really new. Monoclonal antibodies, they're basically giving you an antibody. Um, that's, you know, synthesized from bacteria and, and all that jazz. I, it's, I think right now, obviously, there's a disinformation machine. That's mm-hmm. clearly. The disinformation, misinformation machine is, is powerful. And, it, and in certain ways, this is why, you know, political, you know, I have a political background as well. There's a lot of, you know, bandwagoning. And they realize that anti-maskers and anti-lockdowners are also very much anti-vaxxers. And they see that correlation, and then they're basically politically ramping it up because it's the same base, right? Um, And so it's very easy to ramp up these uh, people. In certain ways, you know, know, people talk about, oh, my body and all that, so experiment. This is really where the disinformation machine really works in that one closed ecosystem so this gets to social media of course as we know has so much dangerous potential and i think you know i think people a they have a very powerful echo chamber echo chambers are i would say one of the most powerful things and, and dangerous even on the liberal side as well sometimes and uh you know the, the call for safe space 
um, and not wanting to have discussion. That's basically you want to protect your echo chamber, right? Um, so I think that is something that is much more systemic, more than just epidemiology or current behavioral economics can immediately solve. We have to literally just break these echo chambers. But how? That's mm -hmm. a bigger media problem. Yeah. So I'm going to start bringing in some of our guests. Kate, if you have any questions. Yeah, I mean, I think so one of the things that you gave this Swiss cheese analogy, I just kind of want to go back to because what I'm I'm hearing what you're saying about all of the different things that you can do, you can do masks, you can do social distancing, you can do vaccines, you can do. But what I'm kind of curious about is if vaccines alone will ever get us to a place in the near future that is going to be able to address this and whether that's done through boosters or how you update vaccines that are based in, and like on an, on this incredible new mRNA technology. Um, and so basically kind of like, what is the next step for like, I'm, I'm head Pfizer and I'm, you know, very, I feel very protected. Um, uh, I will t gladly take a booster or whatever. And like, at what point is that that can we layer that on so that at some point I will be able to not wear a mask? Not that I'm not willing to keep wearing a mask, yeah. but like some point I would, I mean, I'm a person in the world. I like to go running. I like to be outdoors. I like to be indoors occasionally. I teach, I'm a law professor. So like, I like to be able to see my students' faces. Um, and so like wondering like what, when that ends up happening um, and whether vaccines yeah. are gonna get us there and what that timeline looks like in your estimation. Yeah, the, I think eventually, there's, you know, Delta variant has several outcomes. One is we could go the way of India and have a burn through. And a burn through is basically if if we don't do anything, enough people get infected and ergo die, uh, hospitalized and stricken with long COVID. And by the way, yeah. long COVID, among those who were hospitalized, um, there's a seven point IQ drop, hospitalized and uh, intubated. But if you're hospitalized without being intubated, you still get like a three and a half point um, IQ drop. And similarly, even if you're mild, you have, you know, one to two point IQ drops, which is bigger than lead poisoning. Lead poisoning is two points. Um, so I can't all, risk that. We have that I'm going to just start telling people burn. I got long COVID whenever I say something <laughs> I know, stupid long COVID now. <laughs> you know, for everyone who said, oh, I'll live, uh, you'll live. But this is the same quality of life. I don't know. So I think we don't want the burn through. The, the eventually it will, you know, from a combination of vaccinations, if we get it high enough, the issue is us, we're kind of like, we're kind of like petered out in terms of those willing to uptake it. So we've, so I, I, I worry about a burn through among the unvaccinated in the South, especially the vaccine, because it's not like we're going to turn the Titanic of all these people willing to vaccinate overnight, um, willing to mask overnight. The Southern conservative states are not going to lock down and um, we're not going to, you know, ventilation, we're not going to upgrade our HVAC ventilation with MERV 13 filters and UV disinfection. And some places, you know, schools are Im implementing um, obviously like uh, HEPA filters, portable HEPA filters within each class as well as upper air UV. But those things will not, the, the optimal world is obviously compliance with all these, you know, mask and indoor rules and, you know, vaccinations. But my worry is that, you know, I'm realistic. I'm, you know, I'm a realist. And sometimes some people call, call my tweets a little bit doomy, but it's, there is what we, the science knows and what is the actual behavioral economics and behavioral psychology will allow for. And there is obviously people will eventually get tired of it. And so I fear that unless we, in previous in the previous iterations last year, with an R naught of three and a half four, you can suppress it, right? And you can suppress things with vaccines. It's a combination layer to suppress it. But with how contagious Delta variant is, all, you have to do everything, everything I mentioned above: ventilation, masks, you know, vaccinations, and everything. And and but short of that, you're basically headed towards overloaded hospitals. And that's what we have in the South, Arkansas, Oklahoma, Missouri, mm -hmm. Alabama, Mississippi. They're all headed towards overloaded hospitals. And that's that's the word. And that means eventually there's going to be a burn through. Yeah. And the sad thing is, I don't know how to prevent this burn through in, in the South. Like, 
Vermont is 70% fully vaccinated. I think they're all, and they're, people are pretty compliant up there with masks and all these other mitigations. In the South, I really don't know. And this is the honest truth of preventing a burn through. Eventually, India came down. You know, they estimated, you know, two to four million people died in India. You know, they literally, two, two to three million people died in, within just two months. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how to prevent that burn through. And that's, that's, that's a sad thing. Yeah. And a lot of that is due to misinformation because people made this akin to the flu and they're saying that, oh, you've, you've caught it, you're then immune. And is there a lot of it that I hear circulating in those circles is that, well, once I've caught it and I'm, I have antibodies, they're mm -hmm. just as good as the vaccine. And I'd love to hear you respond before I go to our first question. Yeah, that's that I hear that all the time. It gives you protection. Now, before Delta, we have a lot of studies and the protection, remember, first of all, it wanes because we know vaccines when just like antibody, uh, pre a previous natural infection wanes. Mm -hmm. The va vaccine is it's a much stronger neutralization level than just natural infection. So vaccine is stronger and both wane. Um, and we know that previously it protected you about 80% efficacy. And, but among elderly, it was only 50%. A past infection among elderly only give you a 50% eff efficacy, you know, effectiveness against reinfection. But that is with standard variants. With Delta variants, A, t more time has elapsed since that winter study in Denmark with 3 million people. More time has elapsed. We know that six months waning is real. We see it in the data. Mm -hmm. um, we also know Delta is much more evasive and penetrant. And so we know that the reinfection potential um, is huge. And so I, I would say that the one, sh like one shot vaccine efficacy is probably similar to a previous COVID recovery of protection. And we know one shot just does not work. We're talking about less than 30% efficacy, 15% efficacy in some studies. Um, so those people are just being delusional. I, there's no other words about it because if vaccine efficacy drops and vaccine is way better than natural infection in terms of protection, one shot is uh, one, like w one natural infection is just definitely not good enough. All right, thank you so much. And then we're gonna go to our first question from John Hawkinson. Let's see, John, there you are. Hi, Eric, thanks for joining us. So this is a variation on what Genevieve asked earlier, but uh, I, I think the answer, it's still helpful to hear your answer. So it seems like so much of the follow the science discourse is focused on epidemiology and virology, but not on the social science of how humans mm -hmm. follow directions and interpret and internalize public health advice. So we get these major public health decisions like today's without clear advanced billboarding or foreshadowing and people perceive them as arbitrary. But we don't seem to have gotten any better at this. We've been doing it for a year. How can public health communicators and decision makers, you know, both nationally and locally, because we have the same problem locally, or at least that's what I see here in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, how can we do a better job of using social science to offer credible recommendations that, that will actually work that people will follow? Yeah, I think social science is just as important as the epidemiology and virology. I, I always remind people, virologists are basically molecular biologists of viruses. And same with geneticists, they're, they're molecular biologists um, as a general category. Epidemiologists, we work with big data, we're causal statisticians um, in, in a way, but you know, the behavioral science is a very different beast. But I would say more than just behavioral science, you know, there, I have many behavioral science researchers who understand, you know, social and study social psychology. But I think political comms experience is something also very lacking by a lot of academics. I, I mostly left academia. I spent 15 years at Harvard, but I left academia and I live and work in DC. And I think political comms is just so key because optics, you know, you know, perception is reality in many ways. And even if you know, you try to correct a manner, the way that you correct uh, really matters. Um, it's not just saying, oh, I, I hereby take it back. It's, it's, there's a lot of calm strategy around this. And I think Dr. Rochelle Walensky, bless her heart, is a great MGH career Harvard infectious disease physician professor, but she has no uh, real experience in you know, 
behavioral psychology nor political comms. And I would say political comms and public messaging comms, you know, kind of how, how Jenner Pizzaki is specializes in, is actually much more important of a skill right now during this COVID era because how you communicate really dictates how much people listen. And of course, you know, knowing that getting, try to get information, uh, reversing information, getting to the toothpaste back in the tube is uh, politically comms wise, a very, very hard thing. So I think we need all those strategies. And I think the next CDC director should come from more of that kind of fold rather than just, um, than just an academic per se, so. Okay, thank you. And so our next question is from Richard. Richard, the floor is yours. Here I am. Well, I, I'd like to thank you for brightening my day. Uh, and um, actually, I, I, my question is, we, so we continue to hear reports of breakthrough infections and, you know, we, we have one in our audience. And, um, and so based on anecdotes, uh, if we're just based going on anecdotes, there would seem to be a lot more of these than, than we, at least initially, based on the initial reports of what we were seeing with breakthrough and infections, mm -hmm. there seems to be a lot more than we thought that we're going to be. And so, but I, I'm curious, what, what kind of data do we have at this point about the likelihood of contracting a breakthrough infection and its possible severity? And is there also, is there enough data yet to correlate infections and the severity with specific vaccines? Yes, very good question. So I can walk you through some of the data. Um, so in the UK, uh, among young people, about of the hospitalizations, about 10% are breakthrough cases among young people. Among older people, about 40 to 50% of all breakthroughs are actually uh, fully vaccinated. This is a really high number. Um, we also see in many other countries, in, De in, in Netherlands, they reported that 75% uh, uh, of those vaccinated are unvaccinated, but 25% people uh, percent, um, are either vaccinated or unknown status. So I would say like there, they found basically 20% who are breakthroughs among the hospitalized patients. Um, and so we know there's reinfection. The UK report just last week reported that after 180 days, um, the reinfection rate among those vaccinated is about two and a, two is about twofold higher than um, than less than 180 days. So it depends on the variant and it depends on the time since vaccination. So this data is just coming out. This is what is this is what the data that was scaring the living daylights out of CDC about the waning that we saw that you know the drop from ninety to six, seventy to sixty to to uh, now forty percent uh, efficacy from Israel. So re that means breakthroughs is a type of reinfection. Um, so th this breakthrough is happening. The issue is severity. The severity protection is still good. Um, it still provides about approximately 90% efficacy against hospitalization. But, you know, 90% is good, but at the same time, you know, if you have someone vulnerable at home, you know, 90% protection, if you're the worst, say the breadwinner in a, in a family and they're counting on you and you get hospitalized, and of course, all the other long COVID things, I think 90% efficacy is, you know, like, People say that's great, but I don't think that's good enough. You know, this is why you have to take precautions and still wear a mask on top of the vaccines. Because the breakthroughs, there's a lot of infection breakthroughs. And of course, mild is still fever, like in bed for a couple of days. That's that's still mild COVID. Um, and so I, I really don't think that people are appreciating it enough. And in certain ways, the CDC is not highlighted. I highlight it very o occasionally, and, um, and I don't like... I don't go overboard, you know, hitting people over the head with it, but reinfections do happen and you are protected for the most part, but 90%, you have to take a calculation of, are there other people depending on you? Are you the sole breadwinner in your family? You know, are, are you, you have vulnerable people in your family? That's, that's still not high enough in my opinion, because COVID is just so debilitating. 
Agreed. So then up next we have Mateo. Hi, what? thanks for uh, bringing me on. Um, so my question is to maybe make things a little less abstract. Uh, just today, actually, uh, one of the guys that I'm living with right now, uh, in anticipation of someone else coming to visit, uh, took a rapid COVID test with no symptoms and tested positive. Um, they've gone to their room, everyone's masking indoors, but the question is, uh, how concerned should we be? What should we be doing? Try to get a booster shot, avoid flying, all these questions just you know, they're yeah. real right now. No, they're very real. And and I saw someone asked about Johnson & Johnson because Johnson & Johnson is by definition a one-shot vaccine. Johnson & Johnson is from the same family as AstraZeneca, although it's designed differently. It, it, its spike protein resembles the the Pfizer Moderna, but it's from the AstraZeneca family. So I assume that it's in between. But we know that whether it's Pfizer or whether it's AstraZeneca, one shot is does not give you give complete protection. And many of us scientists, it's an open secret in epidemiology and vaccinology that uh, that Johnson Johnson people will need a booster. You know, there was one study that Johnson Johnson did that they said it works fine. Another study from Johns Hopkins uh, two weeks ago says it doesn't work that uh, great uh, against Delta or Lambda. And so I think what many scientists have been doing if they had gotten the Johnson & Johnson is getting the Pfizer Moderna as another shot. I'm not recommending this officially in any way, but I know of many scientists and medical doctors who have done that if they had a uh, Johnson and Johnson, um, they just walked to a different clinic or like different pharmacy than they went before. Again, I'm not officially endorsing it, but this is what's commonly done. CDC has not officially come out I've heard about this yet. a lot though. What? I've heard a lot of people doing that. Yeah, like, a, a lot, lot of lot. people. A lot of people. A lot of people it. like d double, doubling up on their vaccines and taking, if they didn't have mRNA, um, vaccines mm -hmm. available early on and took what they could get, they're they're going back and trying to get like the, the Pfizer or a Moderna yeah. shot. And, and even the White Shots. House, the, the, there was a New York Times and Washington Post report this weekend that says the White House is actively considering recommending a third shot for elderly and immunocompromised, you know, medically vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. Israel is already doing that. UK is going to start that in September for elderly. So many countries are already doing that. Now, obviously, if you get into the vaccine equity issue of people in Burkina Faso and Cameroon have not even vaccinated healthcare workers yet, mm -hmm. yes. But at the same time, we, we have tons of vaccines here. They're expiring soon. Um, you know, there was, a, there was a program to actually bring Mexico uh, workers, um, like they bust them up to San Diego, vaccinated with all of our um, excess surplus uh, Johnson Johnson vaccines. And so we have quite a lot of vaccines, Pfizer, Moderna, and everything. And so given that, and it's hard, you can't ship them overseas, you know, I think it's not irresponsible that a lot of people are doing that. And, and I, I and, you know, I'm not officially endorsing it, but many people are doing this. Uh, and CDC is consider, actively considering this for the elderly and vulnerable as well. Kate, did you want to follow up for it? Oh, I was just going to say that it just isn't a zero sum game like that. Like, I, yes, of course, people and like, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like having milk that's going bad here. And in like, you know, in Oklahoma, and you know, well, it's going to be bad in three days, you can't, you know, we, there's no way to get it to Africa and distribute it and no good like kind of like no clear logistical way to have that happen. It's not quite the same with vaccines where we've become a little bit more sophisticated. But like, to make it simple, it's just kind of like, well, somebody has to drink it. Or somebody should drink it, otherwise it's just going to go bad. So, I mean, yeah, I completely agree. Okay. And so, Jeremy, you're going to get the final question today. Hold on. Hello, Jeremy. Okay, perfect. Hello. Um, so, um, my question is about um, how good epidemiological models are at determining how different variants will spread. Um, I've noticed in, like, especially where I'm from in South Africa, the government was not able to predict this latest wave's peak as well it wa as it was with the previous waves. So their, their response to the, this latest wave has been a lot slower. And I wonder if maybe it's to do with the information only arriving later as we find more out about the actual 
virus, um, the actual strain. Um, yeah. Is it that, or is there a way to sort of generalize a model to sort of see how different variants, yeah. Right, so this is a good question. Um, South Africa has the other beta variant, which is one of, it's even more evasive than, um, than the Delta, but it doesn't spread that fast. Uh, the issue is we kind of know there's a whole slew of mutations that are problem makers, right? We know that by themselves, they're problem makers. Now, Delta has like 20 some major mutations. And you kind of kind of predict that likely it'll be problematic. Although, you know, if they're all the mutations are all in the same place, you don't know if they're going to add, if you don't know if they're going to be additive. But we can kind of presume this is why we're worried about Lambda. And then the Delta Plus. There's two versions of Delta Plus. There's your American version and the European version of Delta Plus. So based on those, we kind of like, hmm, those might be tricky. So hence we have, we have hundreds of variants, by the way, thousands of variants. Um, but we have variants of interest, variants of investigation, variants of interest, and variants of concern. And so all this together, the we kind of predict it. Now, this data on variants of interest, variants of concern, uh, and variants of an investigation are oftentimes buried from like the public view because they're, they're really like they're in page 19 of these government reports and they're not reported because it's not headline news. And but in certain ways, you know, the, the Delta variant was formally first called originally the Indian double mutant. And when people say like, oh, the Indian double, you're just scaremongering double mutant. That means nothing. <laughs> oh, oh, it, you know, it spreads a lot, but doesn't mean it's more contagious. It could just be founder effect. You know, there was a lot of downplaying dismissal people. And of course, Delta, the Indian double mutant was label, re, labeled beta 1617.2. And of course, that number is not very, it doesn't roll off the tongue. And hence, you know, the WHO eventually put out the Greek letters. But the data is out there. The issue is that many people downplay it. So it's kind of like in ab and absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of risk, right? And just like WHO last year said, oh, we have no evidence of human to human transmission. This was early January. Clearly what they should have said, we don't yet know if there is human to human transmission, not there's no evidence of it. Uh, and, but right now there's the, this is why there's, a, there's two camps. There's the precautionary principle scientists camp and public health people camp. And then there's the, down, there's, there are scientists by the way, who are downplaying this. They said India will never be hit by anything. India has hit herd immunity. We've heard this many times. We have hit herd immunity. We've hit herd immunity. <laughs> We've hit herd immunity. This has been a, 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 a repeated Those people should try raising June cows. Of last year. Right? <laughs> like it does. At, at this point, you should just stop saying we've hit herd immunity until like cases really go away. And so this is why, you know, the precautionary principle right now should win the day right now because you know to we don't want lockdowns no one wants lockdowns mm -hmm. but if you don't do the masking the vaccination the indoor things the avoiding all these i don't have ventilation and you know dis air disinfection and all these precautions if you don't have that you're headed towards either a catastrophic burn through like india and part starting to part of the south or you're heading towards a lockdown and then it's even more painful to bring things down. So this is this is the world in which we're reactionary in so many ways. In CDC right now, cases are super high. Delta is now like 90% almost, and, and cases are soaring. And now they finally say, oh, we'll roll back masks, uh, rules, not like unmask uh, rules, and now you have to mask in. But it's, sometimes it's too little too late. And I think that is the best lesson that if you don't know what's going on with the variants, assume the worst and keep, you know, mitigating, keep sounding an alarm. And, but of course, some people say you're going to be over alarmist and you're going to wear people out. But, you know, the pandemic doesn't care. That's mm -hmm. the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a long term shift in how we think of public health um, in our lifetimes, in most of our lifetimes. Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I guess, we've been lucky so far. But it, it is like a, it is a shift. I want to apologize for like the kitten that was like <laughs> climbing so all over cute. me for most of the show. Uh, it did make seem to make things a little lighter in a dark conversation. <laughs> but I'm I'm at it. This is like it's like four. It's like 
three weeks old and just very um, needy. Um, and so just uh, <laughs> anyway, um, but that was not meant to be disrespectful or take away from the seriousness no, of everything we're talking about today. OK, um, but thank you so much for coming on. Yes. Um, the the Greek chorus is the ragtag Greek chorus is very um, as loves it. There's 21 questions and we are on like an off time from when we're normally doing the mm -hmm. show. People have so many questions to ask you. It would be wonderful to have you back um, at five o'clock at a normal time back. at some point. So yeah, let's yeah. do that sometime soon. Sure, let's thank do a catch up. Stay safe. Thank everybody. you so much, and thank you for coming. So that we're going to leave it there, everybody. Uh, we'll be back in twenty four hours and fifty seven minutes at five o'clock tomorrow with Jonathan Last, the executive ed editor of the Bulwark. And until then, we don't have fun anymore. We do have the means to proactively protect ourselves, our communities, and everybody that we love. So mask up and get vaccinated if you haven't. Thank you again. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Bye, Eric. Bye.